Uh, in my talk, I want to talk about API security, as Adam alluded to previously. Um, for those who, who don't know and are just joining here this morning, my name is Travis Spencer. I'm the CEO and founder of Tubo Technologies. And uh, together with Andreas, I founded Nordic APIs two and a half, four-ish years ago. And uh, in this talk about API security, what I want to do is, is look out over the long term or the maybe the medium term and see where is API security going in the next three years and kind of give you some, some practical advice, some practical takeaways that you can use to prepare, uh, and also just some, uh, some more information about what's going on right now so that you can uh, think about that as you design and build your, your API. So specifically, what I want to do is look at this perfect storm that's brewing. I want to look at the different factors, uh, the different things that are going on around us, and how these are sort of culminating in this, this perfect security storm. I want to give you some very uh, actionable advice, things you can do even while you're sitting in your chair to make yourselves safer. So before my talk's over, you guys should all be more secure. And then I want to give you some advice on how you can architect your systems so that your platform that you're building and your APIs that you're launching are more trustworthy and are safer and are more secure. So to get started, let's, let's look at this storm that I'm talking about. Uh, this storm has been brewing and, and coming now for many years. Uh, cloud computing, social, mobile devices, all of these things uh, together are making our societies more, more portable, more mobile. Uh, do you guys remember where you were the first time you heard about and really the light bulb went off with cloud computing? Uh, I do. It was in 2006. I went to a presentation by Amazon and the idea of a virtual machine, a file as a computer that you could just turn on, I mean, that was crazy. That was amazing. And then the very next day I went and I talked with uh, my boss about it and we need to use Amazon and we need to get uh, virtual machines and he dismissed me as some silly kid. And uh, now that, that, that uh, particular boss is uh, working at a SaaS company and that company that I was working for that time is providing uh, many of their services as cloud services. So it's, it, the cloud is, is here. Uh, it's, it's no longer something we can avoid. And it's, it's pushing those companies, it's pushing uh, those naysayers into uh, adopting and using now. Um, there, I, I don't think there's any more doubt amongst organizations. And the reason is you know, the, the mobility uh, of our children and of our families and of our, our kids is making the enterprise required to be mobile. And another thing is in this is that uh, API providers are, are growing and are becoming bona fide platforms on which other organizations can transact business. And so the, the API providers are getting uh, bigger and bigger, more large scale. And these things together are resulting in more and more high value data being accessible over the internet. So there's a lot of uh, important information out there that is uh, available through an internet connection. And more and more people are on the internet, uh, including bad guys. So they have access to that high value data. And this is resulting in many record breaking breaches. Um, Heartbleed, you guys have all heard of that, right? So uh, SSL being totally broken. Um, Poodle, a couple weeks ago, did you guys hear about that? SSL v3, uh, totally broken. And uh, any client or any server can uh, trick the other party into downgrading to SSL v3 and begin uh, decrypting one packet at a time. Um, this is a beast style attack. Um, these are... Uh, large-scale internet uh, breaches that just waiting to happen. And uh, shell shock, have you heard of this? Where uh, um, there's an error in the bash shell, so basically any Unix or Linux system uh, that can be tricked into um, passing an environment variable down into bash, you now have a remote shell execution. These are the sort of things that keep me awake at night. And these are happening more and more often. 
uh, some large retailers who have ended up in the news who have been breached and their payment systems have been compromised at record-breaking numbers. And uh, I know that uh, speaking to some other large retail companies uh, that aren't up there, and they have told me that they're spending any amount of their budget to make sure that their logos don't get next to those guys. So it's like people who have a brand to protect. Uh, we heard yesterday from Lego, very, very cautious with their brand. Uh, these are important precautions that we must be taking because of these large-scale internet uh, breach uh, vulnerabilities that are taking place. So we don't want to end up in this place but they are happening so frequently. I mean, even uh, yesterday or the day before, MySQL um, SQL injection vulnerability, and uh, I was reading one uh, just this morning about J.P. Morgan Chase happening earlier this summer, and um, I mean, I don't know about your guys' blog feeds, but mine is full of them, just breach after breach after breach, vulnerability after vulnerability after vulnerability. Uh, like, you. Did you know that any um, standard browser on an Android phone does not res yet respect the same origin policy? And so every user out there who's using the default Android browser, which is basically everyone, right, uh, that doesn't know better and continues to use that browser, you can use JavaScript on one site to retrieve data from any other site. I mean, this is, this is massive. And it, it's, it's happening so frequently that you, you almost... Uh, it can be bewildering and overwhelming. Uh, a couple others that have been in the news recently that you might have heard about, uh, the fappening. Um, so the, some movie stars uh, were targeted in their iTunes account. And there was a, an endpoint at Apple that uh, did not um, have rate limiting on it. So if an attacker guessed a iTunes account or was aware of an iTunes account, it could send uh, different messages to that endpoint over and over again to try to authenticate until it guessed the password. And the, there was no throttling on that whatsoever. So through a dictionary attack, eventually uh, the spearfishers got the, the uh, victim's username and password. And then they used a tool to uh, go into iTunes and basically download all their iTunes data as a sort of backup. They had all of the images, they had everything that was in iTunes then, and found uh, compromising photos of some uh, well-known movie stars, and then were able to distribute those. And what was interesting was afterward, putting out all of those photos and then sending links around to different people and social media updates to get people to go and look at these nude photos of these well-known actresses, and then uh, fish them, and to get access to their... Uh, I don't know, PayPal accounts or their Facebook accounts or uh, whatever it was that the, the fishers were after. So the, it was almost like the, the attack, the, the real victims were the, the ones afterward who were duped into following the nude photos. Um, another similar one uh, was the snappening, where uh, I'll get into it in a bit, but the, that same sort of thing where all of the data from the social media network uh, was stolen and, and put out there, not directly from Snapchat, uh, but through a third party. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So as, as with the, the fappening, these attacks are becoming more and more targeted. So high-value individuals like sexy movie stars or uh, top executives within an organization are being specifically targeted out because they have very valuable data and they're a way into uh, an organization to get that data. Perhaps that data in itself is valuable or as in the, the snapping can be used uh, to trick others uh, to get more, uh, more information and more data. Another thing that is definitely a pattern is the developers are being um, fished and are being um, spearfished as targets. So developers have a lot of power. They often have very powerful accounts. And so the attackers will try to gain access uh, to, for example, their, their signing keys and things like that so that they can re-sign uh, um, an application that's put into iTunes and then all of a sudden uh, that, iTunes, uh, that uh, uh, application is being used to distribute malware or things like that. Um, also, if you can compromise a developer, you might be able to circumvent uh, certain um, uh, 
barriers in the, the network and find your way in uh, to get access to valuable data. So the developers are being targeted as well as the enterprise. And as more and more API providers are becoming platforms, the platforms themselves are being targeted. So the, they make for a, a great um, victim. And the reason that they are being targeted is because by definition, an API platform is exposing their core value uh, through their API. So there's very high valuable data uh, that's being exposed through that platform. Another thing about a platform that makes them a great target is that they um, have very, they've achieved critical mass. So to be a platform means that you are being consumed by very many users and are, have achieved a, uh, gone over a tipping point. And so there, there's much more possibility of, uh, or return on investment of your time spent attacking a platform rather than someone who has not yet achieved that, that level of adoption. And with a platform being so large, there are many attack vectors, so many different endpoints. Uh, as with iTunes, I mean, uh, Apple has two-factor authentication on many of its endpoints. It has throttling on many of its endpoints. Uh, but one of those within its platform did not. So they were able to be compromised and uh, thus the fappening. Um, so that, that definitely is uh, one concern. And, and as I mentioned, through all of that, uh, the efforts can be rewarded with a high return. So all of these things coming together, for this perfect storm, uh, I believe that by 2017, uh, this storm will have hit land and many, many uh, organizations will be um, thrown to the wayside, bankrupt, uh, gone because of, of security breaches. I mean, in that, that one that I'll talk about in a little bit of uh, the snapping, I mean, the, the third party that's involved there is completely gone. Um, these sort of things will, will happen. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of a hurricane and afterward you see like the ships turned off uh, upside down and the cars and the buildings all broken out. I mean, this is what it's going to be like. This security, uh, not taking security seriously is going to result in a number of companies just closing down. Brands that are compromised or, or will be tarnished and that won't be able to be brought back. So what you need to do is protect yourself as an individual, especially as a developer, because you are the target of organized crime. You need to be very vigilant. You need to be paying attention to these things. You need to subscribe to at least a few blogs and check them every once in a while so you're aware of things. And um, protecting yourself, <laughs> protecting your, your developers, making sure that they're following uh, the same sort of practices so that your developer group doesn't get compromised. And then you also, of course, need to safeguard your platform. So let's, let's look at some ways that you can protect yourself. Um, one way is definitely to reduce the number of passwords you have. Uh, at Tubo, we have a policy that all cloud services that we should use uh, should integrate with Google so that we have fewer and fewer passwords. And in that way, we're using single sign-on to access all of those other cloud services. And this is something I highly recommend that any company of any size should do, is set up an identity provider, whether it's Google, whether it's your own directory, uh, whatever it may be, and use those accounts solely. And if you use any sort of cloud services, have a policy that says those cloud services should use uh, federated authentication rather than the individual getting a new username and new password. And this is important because after that, uh, that person leaves the company, you just have one account to disable. And we go into Google and we turn that user off and now their access to all those cloud services is, uh, is it finished. Uh, they can no longer access them. And unfortunately, many cloud services don't support federated authentication. So you need to know exactly which of those are that are not supporting that and give an exception and be very conscious about that and list those out and have a, a procedure to manually go in and remove those accounts uh, after the employee changes their position within the organization or leaves the company. Uh, otherwise, the moment they do, they'll be able to continue to use those cloud services, continue to have access to your corporate data. Um, and if the, the employee left in a, a less than friendly way, they could even do things that could be harmful to your company. So reduce the number of passwords you have by using single sign-on. And the, the thing that um, 
could be dangerous about following that advice is if you compromise one account, then you have access to all of these different services. So on that, uh, that single authentication that you have tied to with web single sign-on, you definitely want to have two-factor authentication. And you want to make sure that uh, just getting a username and password over someone's shoulder isn't going to be enough to get the, your, an attacker to get into all of those different accounts. So have two-factor authentication. Um, it's, it's, it can be expensive. It can be inexpensive. It can be inconvenient. It can be convenient. There are different ways to do this, but you do need to do two-factor authentication. Have a mobile phone. Have a key fob on your keychain. Uh, do something so that you have to prove that you possess something, not just that you were able to look over someone's shoulder and grab their username and password. <coughs> Don't reuse passwords. Um, I mean, unfortunately, we live in a world where passwords are a fact of life, uh, but don't reuse them. Don't uh, take a, user, a password from one account and use it in another. Um, there are lists out there of well-known passwords, and um, if, if you're reusing them across, and especially if they're from those lists, you are, are making yourself very vulnerable. Use a password manager. I fought for a very long time, Andreas was very annoyed with me on very many occasions because I would not store passwords, even a password manager. Uh, but there's just so many these days, guys. We got to have these. And they'll get, warn us if we're reusing our passwords. So it's just, uh, unfortunately, because there are so many, we need to use them. Don't put passwords in your code. Uh, don't, don't hard code a password in there. Uh, even if you obfuscate it with Base64, come on. Um, I can look at something and see it's Base64 encoded and just you know, don't do that. Put it in a configuration system. Uh, put it in runtime where you have to type it in, um, something like that. But don't hard code it. There are scripts running, looking in GitHub for passwords, um, scanning for Amazon keys, and um, taking advantage of those virtual machines and turning them into, into members of botnets. So, so don't put uh, those into code. And then, so you need to protect yourself protect your developer group, put policies in place, require 2FA as an organization, and as a company, as you're building out your API, make sure your platform is secure. And this has to be a conscious thing. You have to plan for this. You can't just, at the end, slap on some red paint. I mean, that's not how security works. You're going to end up falling victim to something like uh, Beast or Poodle or uh, Heartbleed or one of these other scary things and have your logo up there because you were breached. Um, don't do that. Plan for it. Um, the hurricane is coming. Um, put, put the boards over the window now. Um, put the sandbags up so that uh, it's easier to attack someone else, right? I mean, that's all you have to do is make sure that it's easier for the attacker to attack someone else to get a return, and then they'll attack that guy and not you. <laughs> Because you, you will never achieve ultimate security. So security can't be an af afterthought. You have to architect it in. And as you begin architecting it, start on a secure foundation. The, the foundation that you build on should be the Neo security stack. Uh, the only reason that APIs are being adopted in the enterprise is because we have the security standards to do it. We don't have to use WS security and WS reliable messaging and WS secure conversation and all those protocols that were invented to do high security, which the enterprise required. We can do APIs now because the technologies exist uh, to secure those APIs in, in as much of or even more than we could ever do with WS star. So those protocols are these. We have OAuth 2 for delegated uh, access. We have OpenID Connect for federation. We have the JSON identity suite uh, for identities. These give us things like signing, uh, algorithms, keys, all represented as uh, JSON objects. Skim, or simple uh, cloud identity management for doing provisioning. And we have FIDO for authentication. And across all of it, we need to be doing authorization using something called Alpha. Have you ever heard me talk before uh, and seen this slide before, what you might notice that's different between this and previous versions is the addition of Alpha and Fido. Uh, alpha is a JavaScript sort of uh, syntax of Zacamo. Uh, Zacamo is a, a standard from Oasis for doing uh, entitlements and access control. And using Alpha, we can now do this in a very, uh, in a very easy manner. Um, 
taking away all of that XML cruft from Zacamo. And FIDO, of course, is a new and upcoming standard, but by 2017 will definitely have legs and is something you should be considering for authentication. The thing about the Neo security stack is it's a bunch of PDFs. It's a long, long, bunch of long documents uh, that are not useful in and of themselves. But there are tools, there are implementations, both open source and closed source, commercial and freeware, uh, that implement these various protocols. And we use these protocols uh, and those tools that implement them as the foundation for what we call the Neo security platform. The Neo security platform consists of three things, and you need to make sure and have these in your, in your API platform. And these are the identity management system, the API management system, and the entitlement management system. The identity management system is going to take care of figuring out who someone is, so logging them in, authenticating them, issuing tokens. So in here you have components like uh, an OAuth uh, access control server. Uh, you have things like... Um, um, a login application, identity repositories, these sort of things. In the entitlement management system, you have all of your policies of when you should issue tokens, uh, who should have access to which data, these sort of things. And in the API management system, you're providing that control, uh, uh, that enforcement point uh, to see who is accessing that data and if they should be. So all of your throttling is there, all of your service level agreements, uh, all of that stuff is there together with an integration layer that will uh, connect to backend services that you might be using to, um, to implement your API. Let me give you an example of uh, how Neo Security uh, can could have been used to prevent this happening. So just uh, by way of background, let's look at uh, what this snappening was. So the Snapchat is a social network that uh, lets you store sort of like SMSs, uh, little text messages and pictures, but only last 15 seconds. So it's, it's a, a way of sharing some messages with your friends, and then after just a little bit, those messages will be deleted. So some users of uh, Snapchat, uh, especially non-children, for example, uh, will want those pictures to last longer than 15 seconds. And so uh, there is a tool, there was a tool, uh, called snapsave.com, which you could use as your client rather than the official Snapchat client that would, first of all, store those pictures, store those SMSs, and any response to your messages uh, would be stored, stored and saved. So how this would work is you would put your username and password into SnapSave, and then it would do some things and basically forward that username and password on the request where you're putting a message into the real Snapchat. So even if someone on the other end was using the official Snapchat client, uh, they could communicate back with you. You would save all of, all of your messages. So the, this sort of sideways message was ending up resulting in those being stored. So even after 15 seconds, you would have those messages, you would have those pictures, um, and be able to, to save them. Uh, what happened, though, is that an attacker couldn't get into Snapchat, but that was OK, because this little application was able to be breached through a misconfigured server. So then the hacker had all of those pictures had all of those text messages and was able to troll through them and to do whatever it is that the attacker wanted to do. And in this case, to put them up on 4chan, um, some of those photos were, were not, not ones that you would want to have on the internet, but now they were. So how could this have been prevented? This could have been technically impossible if Snapchat would have built into their architecture uh, OAuth and been using the Neo security stack to make their platform safe. So let's look at how that could have been done. In, in this, we have the user, we have Snapchat, and Snapchat would have had an OpenID Connect server. Uh, OpenID is building on top of OAuth. Um, and in this case, what would have happened is the Snapchat application would have redirected a user to their OpenID Connect server. And there, and only there, would the user log in. And so then, the OpenID Connect server would redirect back to Snapchat. And in this redirect, they would redirect only to a whitelisted URL of that application. 
that Snapchat redirect URL could have been Snapchat colon whack whack, which would have been the protocol registered on the iOS phone or the Android phone. It could have been www.snapchat.com, uh, whatever. It could have been all of those, but they would be in the whitelist. So only from Snapchat's OpenID Connect server would it redirect to those known and trusted endpoints. But because it didn't do this, what happened is that in the redirect, um, or it, if it would have done this, and this was not the official Snapchat client, if this instead was snapsave.com, it would have recognized that as an untrusted URL, not done the redirect, and the, the token, at which point the client would have needed to begin communicating with the Snapchat API, would not be available. So this could have been totally prevented by using OAuth and OpenID Connect in the implementation of the Snapchat platform. So this is why I'm saying that it can't be an afterthought. And it has to be baked into the infrastructure of your system. So now let me give you some conclusions and recommendations and wrap this up. Um, API security is vital. vital. As your platform grows, as you scale up, you will be the target of organized crime. You will be subjected to a constant barrage of scripts that, uh, as Christian for Beep's hand said so perfectly yesterday, they never get tired, they never stop, they don't care who you are, they don't discriminate, they're just going to keep hitting you until you, you break. So you must build your system in a safe manner. You must make sure that you are testing that and that you uh, are monitoring that for breaches so that you can respond quickly. And you need to make sure that your, your personnel, that the people who work for you are secure. You do this by, of course, putting policies in place to say, we're only going to use web single sign-on, we're going to have one account, we're going to have fewer username and passwords, we're going to combine that with an additional factor that requires our employees to have some sort of physical uh, token or uh, device so that we know it really is them on the other end. You want to build your platform on open and modern standards. You want to leverage that Neo security stack uh, to build something that will be future-proof so that by 2017 you're not having to rebuild it or re-architect it. Um, build on those standards that I, that I put up on that slide before. As you implement that and you roll that out, use purpose-built applications that do a very small uh, and a very targeted part of what it is uh, that you need. So that if you need to replace that component, uh, you don't disrupt your entire system, you don't pull apart your entire platform, but use very focused products um, and change them out as needed without disrupting the entire system. Make sure that you you are aware of the Neo security platform, that all three of those components are within your API strategy so that you have authentication, you have authorization, and you have enforcement. Make sure that your identity management system, your entitlement management system, and your API management system are clearly recognizable. You know the components within that and uh, that you're implementing uh, all three of those. Otherwise, you'll have incomplete security, and you could fall victim uh, to one of those unfortunate breaches uh, that I talked about at the beginning of my presentation. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you for your time. And if I have a moment or two, I can answer some questions. But if not, you can uh, grab me during one of the breaks. <laughs>